Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us promptly here at noon at the top of the hour. We're just gonna hold for a couple of moments as we have more people streaming into the waiting room um, before we get started. So sit tight, um, grab your lunch or a tea or a cup of coffee and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thanks for being here. Welcome for those of you who are just joining us. Um, you are here in the Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, Cafe around taking climate action. We're gonna get started in just about a minute or so. I'm waiting for a few more folks to move in from the waiting room into the main room. But know that you are here in the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Cafe around taking climate action. Thank you for being here with us on this increasingly blustery and snowy Friday afternoon here in January. We'll get started in just a, in just a minute or so. And we have a bunch of new folks who just joined us. Thank you for being here. We're gonna start it in less than a minute. Um, we're just waiting for a few more folks to arrive. Thank you for, for joining us today here in the Taking Climate Action Chicago Wilderness Alliance um, Cafe. Um, it's an hour long cafe. So we do wanna get started in just a moment as people settle in. Um, and we'd love to know who's here. So if you don't mind taking a moment and in the chat, providing your name, the organization you're with, um, and then we'll have a sense of, of who's in the room today. Um, we also do ask that as you come into the room, if you could keep your, your microphones turned off um, until there are opportunities to, to engage in Q&A. We will be engaging in Q&A today, so there will be opportunities um, to, to have a robust conversation, um, we hope among all of us and the folks who are helping to lead the initiative. So if you could remember to keep your microphones off until that time, um, but we do encourage folks when it is time for Q&A to turn your microphones on, use the raise hand, hand option. Um, and we can also continue to have a robust conversation in the chat too. If you have any technical difficulties today or if you're having any issues with Zoom, um, please do reach out to Laura Riley, who's here on the call representing Sh Chicago Wilderness Alliance, um, and she or I, I'm Brandon Hayes with Bold Bison, can help you um, if you have any technical difficulties, difficulties as we move through the hour. Um, with that, I think it's a good time to get going, so I'll turn it over to Ted Hafner. Thank you, Brandon, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Hafner. I am the head of the Chicago Wilderness Alliance Climate Initiative, uh, and uh, we're doing our first, this is our first cafe to sort of introduce ourselves to you all in this year of action, right? We've been uh, spending the last couple of years coming up with goals, metrics uh, as each individual team. Sometimes teams form together to coordinate uh, high level goals. Uh, but uh, as you've heard probably a lot over the past month or, or two or three, this is our year of action. So we're really excited. Uh, to get going on that, and, and thank you for coming. Um, I think one of the things that I want you to keep in mind as I welcome you today is um, a lot of the work has been, over the past two years, has been very strategic, but a lot of the work has sort of been opportunistic, right? Um, and that's what I want to keep in your mind today, is that the ideas that you will hear from the topics that have the most energy in our committee right now um, are also still sort of 
semi-formed. So there is opportunity for input and there is opportunity for this idea of energy to coalesce around existing uh, areas of work or uh, new areas of work that bubble up. And as an example of that, uh, I'm sure some of us, at least four or five of us, were in the, 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 the meeting for the, um, the quarterly meeting for the uh, accessing healthy landscapes this morning, there was a lot of good talk in a bunch of the breakout rooms that relate to, to this initiative and topic. And, and I think that's what I talk about when I mean opportunistic and energy bubbling up, right? So let's uh, see where those um, crossing threads interconnect. And I'm really excited about this because I, I think all the groups are now at a point where we can start coming together and, and actually move towards meaningful action. And you'll see a couple examples of that in our breakouts today. Um, so today, what we're going to hope to do is Brandon will give you a high level, um, uh, a high level uh, overview of our goals. And I will start our slideshow now. So please be patient with me as I bring this up. Um, there we go. And I need to share my screen. And oh no. While uh, Ted is figuring out sharing his screen, I um, want to welcome everyone. And for those of you who joined us since the top of the hour, please go ahead and use the chat to put in your name and the organization that you're representing today. We'd love to know who's in the room. Thanks. Okay, can we see this now? Can everybody see the green vision slide? It looks, it looks great. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I went for, uh oh. Okay, so as I was saying, Brandon is gonna give us a 30,000 foot level. We're gonna have two sort of spotlight focuses, one on uh, GR and policy, which has had a lot of energy and momentum. Uh, because of the funding that's coming down, as well as the policy that's that's been created over the past couple of years and is now going into rules. And Alicia Sanchez from the Nature Conservancy will cover that. Um, and then we had hoped to have Kristen Voorhees, who is the project manager for the Climate Action Plan for Nature, join us today. But unfortunately, she has a family emergency and will be uh, covered by Doug Stotts, who is also on that team. And then after you hear about those, we're just going to have a general conversation uh, about the energy, the uh, things that bubble up, the things that people notice. Um, and then what the other thing, the last thing I wanna note is that, that this is going to serve as sort of the jumping off point for next week's quarterly meeting, um, which we hope as many of you can join as possible. And that is Tuesday, the 31st at 10.30 a.m. Uh, that will be on a slide later, so you don't have to write that down. But that's just the flow of the day. And I, again, I want to thank you for taking time out and joining us today. Go ahead, Brandon. Thank you, Ted. And I want to echo Ted's thank you, particularly to those of you who are new to Chicago Wilderness Alliance, who may be going to Congress in November was the first time that you connected with the Alliance. Um, and those of you who maybe even just this moment is the first time you're really connecting into one of the initiatives or some of the, the Alliance's work. So we do want to welcome you here today. Um, as many of you who are on the call, particularly those of you, could you, yeah, thank you. For those of you who are on the call, particularly those of you who were on the earlier meeting that Ted alluded to, I see multiple of us who were on that call this morning. Um, it's a whole day of Chicago wilderness. Um, <laughs> there'll be a little bit of a repeat um, for the, at this moment. We do want to, to set today's conversation and the deep dives that we're gonna be doing with Alicia and Doug in the context of the green initiatives of the Chicago wilderness. Wilderness Alliance. And of course, the Chicago Wilderness Alliance is an alliance of hundreds of agencies and nonprofit partners, businesses, corporations, and individuals across the region working toward a greener future for, for um, the Chicago region, stretching from Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and into Michigan. Um, as part of that big big picture goal. Um, we have broken the work into seven green initiatives. You see them represented here on the screen. I am definitely not going to read all that text, but I will just draw your attention to 
the icons for each of the initiatives um, and showing how the, the icon represents that they flow together, that none of these initiatives happens in a vacuum um, and that all of them are interconnected. And that's a big piece of the work, just as we are an inter interconnected alliance. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, but we are talking about some of the priorities and goals of taking climate action, which is, of course, in itself a gigantic task uh, that we face on a global level. So what does that mean for the Chicago region? Um, some of the strategies that have surfaced over the past um, several years of work include mitigation, um, definitely sort of thinking about how the impacts of climate will affect the, our Chicago wilderness region and the greater Midwest and Great Lakes area. Um, government relations and advocacy, and that's one of the deep dives we're going to be doing today immediately after I stop talking and we'll turn it over to Alicia to talk about government relations and advocacy, advocacy a very important piece and a very important strategy and priority. Next slide, please. Community awareness and education. So that engagement broadly across the region, um, especially as we think about and take into consideration those who are most climate vulnerable um, in our four state alliance. Um, ecosystem resilience and adaptation, um, definitely thinking about how we maintain you know, biodiversity and the biodiversity crisis that we are facing too in, in jointly with the climate crisis across the region. And a lot of the initiatives across CW or CWA, excuse me, are, are tied to biodiversity. And we wanna think about how climate fits into them most most you know, readily. And then climate equity and environmental justice. And um, alluded to that a bit, the most vulnerable among us in terms of communities, in terms of populations, and sort of there are there are sort of intersectional legacy, interconnected and intersectional legacies of um, racism um, that do undergird the most climate vulnerable among us. One of the, and if we can move to the next slide, please. So those are just some of the priorities. And we were building on accomplishments so far. And on this slide, I do want to call your attention to that third bullet. The climate, it talks about the climate action plan for nature, because that is a big priority piece of work that we that we have a lot of energy around moving forward as we enter 2023 and this time of action for the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. And that's what Doug will be briefing us on um, after Alicia on today's call. Um, and I just want to call, draw everyone's attention to why it matters. Robust action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is the only way to preserve a livable planet and thwart the worst impacts of our changing climate across the Chicago Wilderness Alliance four state region. And that really is why we are here today. So with that quick overview, um, very quick overview, please do feel free to ask questions about it or you know, surface anything that you might be thinking in terms of this overview in the chat. But um, I do want to move us on and invite Alicia to um, join to lead us on a deep dive into the policy work. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, my name is Alicia Sanchez, and I work with the Nature Conservancy Illinois chapter on federal policy. But with the Chicago Wilderness Alliance, I hold a dual role in managing the climate advocacy and government relations strategy and co-leading the government relations community. And through these roles, I am tasked with sharing timely legislative opportunities with Alliance members via uh, action alerts, cafes, social media blasts, and more. And this is a, an especially exciting time in the world of climate policy. So over the past two years, we've experienced historic wins with the passage of groundbreaking bills that put us on the path forward to meet those critical 2030 decarbonization and emissions reductions metrics, two of which being the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And as environmental and conservation practitioners, right now, it's important for us to begin sifting through the various provisions and programs of these bills to discern what's relevant for our work and equally importantly, the work of our partners. And although this was a huge victory, at the end of the day, bill passage is only one piece of the puzzle. Now comes the implementation phase where we must monitor for upcoming opportunities to ensure that the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act are both 
both implemented in a way that's in alignment with the original intent of these pieces of legislation and maximize the associated climate action and progress there. The Alliance has been discussing how to best disseminate information on these new grant programs and federal dollars with Alliance members. It's important though to reiterate that this is a, these are both hefty pieces of legislation, hundreds and thousands of pages of new funding. And even the experts who had a direct hand in crafting these packages are still waiting to learn more about further details regarding the rollout of these programs and same goes for the agencies who are charged with administering. So if you could please go on to the next slide. Thank you, and just leave that one photo, thank you. So first, I today I just wanted to highlight some new resources that will really help us navigate that territory. So the White House recently released its guidebook on the Inflation Reduction Act. And side note, I will be popping links to all of these in the chat um, when I'm done with this portion. Um, and this guide is super user-friendly and it compiles all the eligibility criteria, timelines and cost share requirements for the new grant programs of the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's an excellent resource for those who are looking to familiarize yourself with these federal dollars to peruse and see if there's anything that's applicable to your work. And if you could just press the next arrow key, please. Thank you. You could use some inspiration from projects that have already received these federal dollars. The Atlas Climate Portal tracks investments from both the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is helpful in providing examples for folks who might be interested in applying for coming funding cycles. And if we could just press the next arrow key one more time. Um, finally, the Climate Power Education Fund Research Library is compiling a tracker of new clean energy projects across the nation. And this is updated frequently along with associated news reports and the number of resulting jobs and so on and so forth. Together, these resources really assist with providing uh, proof of concepts so that others can replicate and reproduce to enact and actualize clean energy solutions at that larger scale. So Chicago Wilderness wants to act as a resource as we navigate this new territory. In August, we hosted a cafe that gave a general overview of the Inflation Reduction Act. Now that more information is quickly becoming available, we want to continue that energy and momentum there. So this will be a big topic of conversation in coming meetings of the climate team, including the quarterly meeting on the 31st. So if this is a space that you would be interested in collaborating and please reach out to either Laura and I and I will be uh, popping that uh, my email in the chat shortly here and then last but certainly not least uh, Ted are you okay if I share my screen real quickly thank you I just wanted to give a, another plug right here. So this is the external facing government relations uh, community page, which I will also share the link with here. And I just wanted to flag a few resources that the government relations community can provide to help support partners in their respective advocacy work. So if you go to about midway down the page, we have our priority and principle document hyperlinked right here. This gives a really helpful overview and how the government relations community can help and realistic tangible actions that we can take to support partners and members in their advocacy work. You see some lists um, of other action alerts that we've shared recently, but um, most importantly, we have our policy action request form that is available for all Alliance partners and members. If there's a specific piece of legislation or some sort of policy campaign or some sort of call to action, partners and members can submit this form. And this is directed uh, immediately to members of the government relations community. We will assess and respond to you with actions that we can potentially take to support. So that is 
is a very powerful platform and pathway uh, for you to amplify your work and have a one stop shot that connects you to other conservation professionals and organizations with similar interests there. So with that, I think I want to make sure that there aren't any questions at the moment. Do I see any hands being raised? No, I don't see any at the moment. So with that, I'm going to toss it over to Doug, but if any of those items, whether it's helping with federal funding or collaborating with the government relations community on a timely uh, legislative opportunity or policy action, please reach out to me. We are here to be a resource. And then I think with that, I'll pass it back to Doug. All right, Doug, you should be good to go. I think this is your first slide. Doug, you're on mute. Um, so I'm Doug Stotts from the Field Museum. Um, I think it's really too bad that Kristen can't be here today because she has the best feel for what's going on here. I've been involved in it and I've been part of the climate uh, community here in Chicago wilderness, more or less since that community got organized back in the late 2000s. Um, the, we created a climate action plan for nature I believe in the year 2010, under the leadership of Bob Mosley from TNC, Bob left us to focus more on Asia. Um, and then Abigail Derby Lewis and myself acted as leaders of the climate committee until, uh, which was the task force at the time back in the olden days, um, until turned over the reins to Ted last year. So, um, so I have a lot of experience with what's going on here. And right now we're in the process of we, we looked through the climate action plan um, while we were working on the goals for the climate um, initiative. Um, and there's a lot of useful information in there, but it's also woefully out of date. Things have changed a lot in the last uh, dozen years. And so it was decided that creating a new version of the action plan was appropriate. Um, also the, the technology to support it was, you know, it was basically a PDF. So we've come a long way since then. So hopefully we can do a lot more interesting things with the material that's produced. Um, the Field Museum and Nature Conservancy provided some resources to enable us to hire uh, Kristen to direct the, the development of the plan. Um, she comes to us from her last position was working with the Midwest Climate Adaptation Center of the US, for, or US Geological Survey. And so she has a really useful background in this area. Before that, we worked with her on Monarchs when she was at the uh, um, US Fish and Wildlife. So she's been a long time um, member of the conservation community here in the Chicago area. And we look forward to uh, helping her make this go forward. So we view this as one of the major projects for the climate committee this year. Um, and the, um, I don't wanna fail to mention the Morton Arboretum, which has also been part of this. We've also met with some outside climate experts, including Don Wubbles from the University of Illinois and Catherine Hayhoe from, oh God, some Texas university, but um, probably one of the most prominent uh, US um, voices on, on climate. And what we're looking to do is 
a variety of things. A lot of this is there are versions of this in the original climate action plan, but they'll be updated and um, made more relevant. But we want to look at the trends in in terms of climate um, change. One of the aspects for us here in Chicago, in the Chicago region, is that until very recently, the climate plan or the climate models have ignored the effect of the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, that's something that really changes the dynamic that hopefully we'll be able to put into this, this new plan. Um, one of the things that came out of the last Climate Action Plan for Nature was a um, update to the Regional Biodiversity Recovery Plan on Climate Change that Abigail Derby Lewis led. And so that provides the basis for the second piece, which is um, the existing act, uh, impacts on habitats and recovering species. Um, we'll be looking at adaptation strategies for habitats and biodiversity um, biodiversity in the area. And we will also be thinking about how nature can be used to help with the adaptation and resilience for people that live in the Chicago region. And this is a element that was really not part of the original climate action plan for nature. Finally, we'll think about nature-based mitigation. So how nature helps us mitigate climate, climate impacts um, and um, reduce the net emissions from here. So there'll be a variety of opportunities for people to take part. There will be a series of workshops set up and working groups created that people can join. Um, we'll also be, one of the things that we'll be doing throughout this is trying to um, coordinate the development of the action plan for nature with other CW initiatives and other communities that have done climate action. A number of the um, metropolitan area municipalities have climate action plans. They tend to be focused on the built landscape and people. And one of the things we want to try to do is integrate um, the nature piece into those plans as best we can. And then finally, um, we will be using the, um, the existing sort of structure of the climate committee, which has different sub sub pieces that uh, have already been talked about in terms of mitigation adaptation community education and policy and we we sort of look for those groups to help turn the climate action plan into for nature into a document that will influence how um, Chicago wilderness goes forth in doing climate action and uh, I think that's what I have to say. Thank you, Doug. That was really good. Um, thank you for filling shoes and stepping in. <clears throat> um, are there any questions for Doug or for Alicia um, on these specific deep dives? How about, um, I, oh, go ahead, Doug. In answer to the question I see in the chat about the time frame, is we're looking to have a sort of initial um, draft toward summertime this year. And then, but there'll be a lot of additional work that will need to be done. But I, I'm, I'm guessing we're looking at a time frame of, a year to a year and a half to when it's end, but maybe six to eight months before there's something that's broadly available for um, work. In terms of when we're looking to start ESA, we've already started, uh, but the we're still sort of getting ourselves organized. And to be honest, I don't know what the sort of time frame is where we think we'll start um, rolling things out to people outside of the group that's kind of 
in the process of developing the strategy for it. This is why we need Kristen here. She'd have a better idea. Well, and, and one of the other good points that you bring up, Doug, is like other Chicago wilderness initiatives, um, and I'm thinking specifically of the fire topic right now, the prescribed burns, right? Nature Conservancy and the Field Museum have generally stepped, uh, generously, sorry, stepped in to provide funding for this Chicago Wilderness Alliance plan, right? So it's our plan, but it's their resources. And one of the things we're struggling with right now is, is letting these professionals do their work while still allowing us as an alliance with um, ideas, goals, and energy, uh, you know, that bubbles up to participate. And, and so that's one of the, the, the conversation points that's taking place right now is how do we allow the general membership to, to play a part in this very, very necessary and important document? Because we do see it as sort of highlighting um, the impacts and the opportunities that a lot of other climate plans for municipalities probably can't focus on just because they don't have the bandwidth or the technical prowess just to focus on the, the nature aspect, right? And the, right. the biological aspects of what we're, we're kind of undergoing in the changes that we're seeing. So, you know, this is a dicey concept right now. And, and the way that I think we're gonna move towards this at least initially is to see where the intersections between the, the climate action plan for nature is, as well as Alicia's, Alicia's work um, with advocacy and policy and the work of the education arm of our group. I think those three sort of subgroups can play really well in this sandbox. And, and to tee up next week's meeting, we're gonna put those three in a breakout room together to see where some of those opportunities um, lie and to see where some of those barriers lie. So if you're particularly interested in this topic and how the education and outreach group can participate and how this can intersect with uh, policy and advocacy, um, please come back Tuesday uh, because that, that breakout room is gonna be, I hope, really exciting. Um, the other aspect is we're gonna have a breakout room on the things that are, are have less excitement, which right now is mitigation because that's ahead and adaptation, but I think there's still lots of good discussions that can happen underway there. Um, like for instance, we got in a really great discussion in the presentation this morning, in the meeting this morning, about um, different types of redlining, historic, current redlining, and, and how that impacts our work as a climate committee in terms of resource allocation, how we go about uh, doing our work and communicating our work. So. Um, that's why we sort of had these deep dives today. This is where the energy is right now, but we have all these other things that we have to figure out too. Um, Brandon, do you have any, oh, there's more questions, right? So um, yeah, we have a question from Marcella in yeah, the chat ahead. and then we have Laura with her hand up. Go ahead. Marcella, uh, Marcella's you question. Your question? So yeah, I, uh, so in answer to the question, I would say we're not at the point where we can sort of think clearly, or, or at least I can clearly articulate what the plan outcome implementation strategy will look like. Um, the the um, previous version of the climate action plan for nature is, I believe, available on the um, or at least the executive summary is available on the uh, Chicago Wilderness um, website. And I would say, if you look at that, you'll get a sense of the types of things that would be part of it, but that would be sort of thinking that's 10 years old or more. But um, we'll, we, this is, I mean, essentially the, these, strategies will be what we're in the, what we develop together with other members of Chicago Wilderness over the next series of months. 
And I think an equally important question there is also what will be the socialization strategy? How will we share the final project with key stakeholders outside of Chicago wilderness, um, those decision makers, community leaders, because that I think what will help tie it to an implementation strategy. And and I would agree with that. I think what I would what I would characterize as one of the weaknesses of the first um, action plan was that we didn't really have a, a system for making its recommendations something that were implemented in practice. Um, they were sort of out there for people to take advantage of, but not, we didn't do that next step and make it, make it an intrinsic part of the work that was being done. So we'll need to do better on that. Laura, we have a question from Laura. Question? Yeah, thanks, Brianna. Yeah, I, I, I just, um, I'm trying to figure out the right place for if, you know, if NCH2 and myself is, we're about making sure we're on goal number five, you know, closing the gaps and inequitable access to safe and welcoming nature for people. And at, at the same time, knowing that you know, human interaction and nature can affect nearby species. And, you know, it's sort of this intersection of issues. And then at the same time, wanting to make sure we have the resilience and mitigation strategies in place. Where does all of that meet in, in, in this particular group? Or do we take it to goal five and the goals of that group? That's a really interesting question, Laura. And I think to be fair, it's, it's one that we, str we struggle with. Um, in the past two years, like I said, we, we've sort of, we haven't sort of, we have been organizing and coalescing around these goals that we've written, all of the seven different initiative teams, right? Those were more or less done in silos, although the climate part I, we all were sort of listening in other rooms and other meetings. So some of our goals reflect that coordination. That said, I think as part of this year of action, there has to be deep coordination as we see this energy bubble up, right? And, and I think, Brandon, maybe you could speak about this tension between the energy of where we find momentum and the necessary things that don't have the energy behind it and, and the tension there, right? Because I think that's some of what Laura is talking about as we sort of wrangle this huge um, alliance and network towards a common goal and finding that sweet spot of where, you know, we can increase the opportunities to access nature, but we also increase community resilience. Um, human health and mental health and all of that. Am, am I understanding your, your question right? And did I get that sort of as a, a good answer to you, Laura? Are you satisfied with that answer or, or not? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. It's like, just to make sure that, you know, the human aspect of, knowing that nature is essential to community resilience. Like even in the Chicago, city of Chicago announcement two weeks ago about their RFP and projects, community resilience is a bucket that they're, to which they're funding, but nature is not part of that, only if it's tree canopy or pollinator gardens. And, and, and so, yeah. That's, I think that's where we're trying, you know, that's what Doug was trying to say is that's the missing component from the last plan that we're really trying to get in this plan so that we can have a voice in that conversation and serve as the sort of authority for nature that we see deficient in a lot of other plans because they only address tree canopy as one item and it's not a holistic thing, right? I think that's what we're hoping to get out of this. And to answer your your question that you sort of you sort of referred yeah, to you. me, Ted. Um, one of the things too we have to remember, um, especially for those of you who are are new to the alliance, that this is an alliance. Um, that that this is largely volunteer, or you know the efforts 
of staff, you know, staff from other organizations. So Chicago Wilderness Alliance itself um, does not have staff. Everyone who, who does that work, like Bold Dyson, my firm, are contracted to do it. But for instance, the time that Ted, the time that Doug, the time that Alicia are spent are spending on this, you know, is either volunteer time or you know additional time or time of the commitment of their organizations to move this work forward in this collective way. And when you're working within an alliance structure in a collective structure, that you really have to prioritize where there is energy and resources and capacity within the network. So some of what we're moving forward in each of the initiatives, including the climate initiative, is predicated on where there is energy, like where there is the ability and the energy to move things forward. You know, and, I, and Doug alluded to that a bit too, with the generosity of the Nature Conservancy and the Field Museum, exactly that for sort of that time and capacity to move things forward. So, so there's a balance there in terms of, of what an alliance model can move forward as we, especially as we moved in, move into an action mode. I wanna say one other quick thing while I have myself off or have myself off of mute, which is, you know, taking an even further step back um, to Laura's good point about sort of nature and sort of in sort of, you know, thinking beyond even, you know, what the city is putting forward and its plan and that type of thing is really taking that step back and thinking about the strategic importance of the Chicago region nationally um, and even internationally in terms of the resources that we have. So, for instance, a lot of the conversation going on around climate in food work is this realization that the Central Valley of California and the Salinas Valley of California are you know, no longer going to be able to support the types of food production that they have historically. And so when you have a region like the Chicago region with access to water through the Great Lakes and soil and that in not having to rely as much necessarily on the Oglala you know, aquifer in the Great Plains, that Chicago becomes strategically important as a place where we can grow food for the nation. Um, and likely, and also similarly, as we think about how cities in Texas, like Houston and San Antonio, are going to be more like Dubai in the, in the, coming, in the coming decades, that we are also going to see an influx of, of um, internally displaced climate refugees coming to the cities of the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes because of access to water and climate and because and because they aren't having we aren't having the similar types of immediately destructive impacts that they are on the coasts and the Sun Belt in the country. So so it really is sort of like in like thinking at that bigger scale about how absolutely fundamental Chicago is just on all of those scales um, for you know the future of how we live in the country and the continent. And, and to follow up on Brandon's point, it's not that we don't have energy in these other areas. Um, I have ideas for a whole bunch of stuff. I'm sure everybody on this Zoom has wonderful uh, ideas for climate action. It's not that there isn't space for that. Let's bubble those up and see if there becomes energy or if there is alliance, which there probably is, to other uh, momentum efforts or momentous and momentum building efforts that that uh, are underway within CW. So as an example, like right now, the things that are bubbling up for adaptation are prescribed fire, cooperative weed management. Um, we're working on uh, the, the green infrastructure uh, initiative with the Growing Chicago project, right? That's rights of way that can connect our natural areas or become natural areas themselves if they have the right conditions to increase habitat and mobility for species to uh, have better survival rates, right? So those are the things that we're thinking of, but that doesn't mean that we can't think bigger like, boy, how do we become uh, allied with the, the Sunrise Movement, right? That would be awesome if Chicago Wilderness and the Sunrise Movement could come together and coordinate for action, right? That would be a big plus. Another thing that I've been thinking of lately and I've seen bubbling up is this notion of climate reparations as a means to, to uh, participate in the reparations discussion. I have no idea if that's a really good thought for this region, but boy, it, it, it starts you thinking, doesn't it? So it doesn't mean those ideas can't bubble up and they should bubble up. That's what we want, but we also need to find the opportunities that align with the other groups. Um, and to, to, to carry this on, can, to bring this back full circle, Danny asked a great question 
um, in the chat. D Danny, do you want to just come off mute and ask your question in any other qualifiers, or do you want me to read it and address it? I can ask it. Yeah, please. Um, I wasn't sure if it was going to derail too much, so I just threw it in the chat, but um, kind of building off of what Laura was bringing up, you know, and seeing the mention of community resilience multiple times in these slides and that aspect. Um, what are the opportunities for engaging like non CW affiliated community organizations or grassroots movements in this planning process? And what, you know, like, how could we cooperate between the different initiatives, you know, goal five, obviously, we're very concerned with increasing representation of BIPOC and other like, um, traditionally excluded groups in nature and so connecting with community organizations and um, initiative leaders who are doing like on the ground grassroots work in different communities is definitely on our list and also just knowing that community resilience will look different for different communities especially like across the broad chicago wilderness region you know what resilience looks like in lake county versus like the calumet area versus southwest michigan are going to be very different things though they may be very aligned um so i guess just if there's like a way that there could be consideration of getting you know, people involved in like the back end of these plans, having that community input and voice as part of that process. And you may have already touched on this a little bit or spoken to it. I had to drop off for a second earlier. So apologies if that's the case. But yeah, I think it would be really helpful to have that kind of information as part of the plan in the first place, rather than just part of the implementation. So um, I, I will say that, that we we definitely agree with you. And that's one of the discussions right now is is that piece is is how to bring the the community part into this. And um, you know, I'm not the right person for that. It's it's going to be in conjunction with people that really understand where the communities are, and they're going to be it's going to be necessary to think about different communities in different areas. All of them will have different aspects that will have to be part of it so that is definitely part of it we want that to be up front you know not something that after we've done it all we'll say okay now let's think about how communities fit in with this we want that to be up front so um i think i'm i don't know exactly what kristen's thinking on that i think it probably would make sense at least as a starting point to bring this to the the equity um group here in the next couple of weeks i don't really know what the schedule would look like i'm not sure how long kristen's going to be sort of out of commission but but definitely we want that to be a part of this and we want it to be a part of it at the start not something we add on at the end yeah i think it could be helpful to have maybe a convening of some groups who have strong community partnerships in different areas of the region right. to have some input and maybe the idea of kind of trying to formulate some sort of round table or event where we get different stakeholders and community representatives to the table to kind of get that feedback could be really helpful that could also be a form of a cafe brandon i don't know just say just spitball in. so danny not to put you on the spot but um are you available for tuesday because i see this is part of that conversation for Tuesday. And if you're not, maybe we punt that aspect of it until we can find a time that is mutually beneficial. Cause I do think there are a lot of synergies here. And, and you know, I'm glad you're realizing this. I think we, we just haven't gotten to that point yet where we could coordinate with you guys, but we've been trying, right? And you guys yeah, are no. We're all busy. <laughs> I think honestly, all of the initiative leads could benefit from getting together. Um, yeah. Brandon and I were talking about that a bit too, but I am I will be out of town uh, for a conference in DC on Tuesday, but I'm happy to connect uh, another time and find okay. a way to- Yeah, we'll definitely keep you in the loop and posted. Thank you. Thanks. And semi-related, going back to the government relations community resources I was flagging and that action alert system, the policy action request submission system, I do see as we move forward in these equity and EJ conversations, see that as a really powerful pathway to help foster that grassroots mobilization and lend our platform as a large alliance to folks who are maybe working on some of these front of the line hyper local issues there as well and to magnify that and make sure that that message is spread. Um, I think that that could be a powerful form of uh, allyship there. A couple over the past couple of months, we have explored this by sharing action alerts 
um, encouraging folks to file in support of some environmental justice cumulative impact legislation. A couple of other examples like that, and we did have some really positive feedback there. So definitely something that I would like to continue. Thanks, Alicia. And I also want to give a shout out to Riverside. Uh, thank you, Lisa. You are the fourth person in the last two days that has brought Riverside up in, in this uh, example as a, not only something to look at, but, but also something to potentially uh, coordinate with and, and embrace. So um, that's as that's bubble up on our radar screen, um, that's something that we're going to look into as well. Um, and for those who are watching the video later, could you could you read into with your voice what what yes. Lisa put into the Sorry. chat? Thank you. Uh, so Lisa says Riverside, Illinois, is part of C4 Cross Community Climate Collaborative Sustainability Team that includes 16 municipalities in West County. Now, in my understanding of this, and maybe there are others on here, I think that can speak more to this, but they just had a meeting in the past couple of weeks um, that has passed this C4 uh, package and is really looking to start implementing it. And it's, it's really impressive. Um, I still need to do some reading on it. If, if uh, I don't know, John, if you are still participating and wanna talk a little bit more about that, I know you gave me some information on this because you're part of that project as well as uh, I think a couple others. So Lisa, yeah. John, anybody else? I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Lisa um, as she's more eloquent than me, um, <laughs> but, but it is interesting. I think that these different communities that are part of this collaborative are probably gonna be looking at nature um, little differently in each community and Riverside's mm -hmm. probably going to be more in line with uh, what Chicago Wilderness's goals are from the start anyway. Yeah, I, I would agree with John's statement. You know, it's really interesting. I, I think the fact that there's 16 communities that gives you a huge reach out right away, right? Where there is, and they're all in West Cook County, so it's great. Everyone's going to be a little different, you know, uh, Riverside's the only um, uh, town or city municipality that was uh, uh, designed and developed by Frederick Law Olmsted. So, so I, I'm part of the Landscape Advisory uh, Commission in town. So we already have some things structured and you know how Riverside is structured versus like a, a, a community like Oak Park, which is so much larger than we are, right? that has a very different structure on parks and rec than we do. Um, but I think the reach out will be fantastic because you'll get to the right people in all those communities. Um, I'm just gonna get Laura the best contacts. I mean, there's an executive board, but um, I'll get you the best links and stuff and send it back to the crew. That would be great. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, and then while this is top of mind, we are also, um, this is sort of a shameless plug, but I, I'm coordinating right now with Edith Macra to do a presentation to uh, a regional meeting of, of the American Society of Landscape Architects on the uh, Greenest Region Compact and that municipal plan that has 280 communities surrounding Chicago in it. Um, so we're trying to get linked into them. And, and, and honestly, I think for me, one of the biggest things missing and that I hope CW can play is as connector and facilitator, because there are all these little individual efforts that are going on, but they're not connected. The state isn't connected to the, the Greenest Region stuff. It sounds like to me, Riverside is not part of the Greenest Region, but I don't know. Um, they may be one of those 250 communities, but regardless, there needs to be more connection so that we can, I think we're beyond a point where we, can get away with redoubling our efforts, right? We have to be efficient. We have to know what people's going on, what, what's going on with people and communities. And, and I'm hoping that there's a connection role that CW can play in this. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Now I'm starting to look at time and recognizing we have seven minutes left. We might have time for another question or two before I get to some housekeeping stuff. Uh, but I wanted to check in with Brandon first. Are you good, Brandon, with how this has gone? Do you have any closing remarks? Um, I think this is this has been great. Um, and and 
Yes, I think this has been great, Ted. Okay, good. Um, any last questions before I go to wrap up and uh, sort of business stuff? Nope. I want to note Jim's comment uh, that our climate action plan for nature will be looking at CMAP, sewer pack, and NERPC uh, plans as well. We will be. We hope to be. Um, we also hope to be looking at uh, some of the state climate or state wildlife plans and folding those in. Um, because like I said, we want to sort of take the best of all of them, but compile one sort of nature rich uh, document for adaptation and mitigation. Um, so uh, I guess we did this already. Sorry, I meant to be on this slide for most of the time, but we've talked about that. Um, and then the last uh, is really just to thank you guys for coming and giving us your time today, giving us your thoughts and attention. Uh, please do come back on Tuesday or um, at any of the other quarterly meetings. We have set them for the year here um, in, in the hopes that we can make this uh, sort of institutionalized. Today was uh, different just because of, or next week is different just because of today's um, cafe but they will be always the second Fridays of the month at 11 a.m. And then we will alternate uh, in between with our leadership meetings. So if you wanna come to those two, those are open. Um, and we do take uh, newcomers and questions and, and open people at that as well. But that's just a smaller group that sort of works behind the scenes, mostly to coordinate with other groups um, and move this work forward. Uh, if you want to email me directly or any of us directly, I think Alicia gave her, you her email, Doug put his out there, uh, here's mine. Um, please do reach out with any questions and, and we're looking for folks to participate meaningly, meaningfully in that give get that, that we're working on as a network. So we hope we give you things, that's my goal, is to make this uh, relevant and helpful to you guys, um, but also to have you give us stuff that helps our, our work, all of our work move forward. Um, and, and this was the second of seven um, initiative or initiative team cafes um, that will be formatted similarly to this one. We've already heard from um, the Healthy Landscapes team last week. Today was the Climate Cafe. Um, and again, it will be a big sort of big picture overview of the work of each of the initiatives with some deep dives on various topics. Um, we are still scheduling the next cafes, but it looks like like water, uh, green infrastructure, and agriculture will be coming up next um, as we move into February and March. So please do look out for those. Excellent. Well, any last thoughts or questions? I'm happy to let you go three or four minutes early and, and thank you for your time again. Hearing none. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Have a great weekend.